This is the Open University. Welcome to the um, Open University where we are um, great believers in the play ethic. This is a, a waistcoat, actually a double waistcoat, because it's red on one side and green on the other. But I seem to match better with the red today, so I'll have it that way around. Um, for children to strap on and then throw balls at each other, which is a, a weird ritualization of a sort of aggressive impulse. It seems to me that children should want to be destroying each other, or even just enacting each other's destroying, destroyment, destroyance, destruction. <laughs> Sorry. I'm reaching for the words today. And um, I thought I would talk to you today about um, advancement. Uh, advancement in life, the idea of progress, personal evolution, um, tribal evolution, and um, a related cluster of ideas. We're going to unpack, unpack today. I always love it when academics are going to unpack something because it makes them sound like lackeys, like you've been on a voyage of discovery on your own and you brought back all your souvenirs and your luggage and the academics are going to unpack your baggage and actually tell you something about what you found, hopefully confirming that you have uh, found things of value, maybe the Elgin marbles, maybe it's an imperial loot that you've brought back, a hole, and uh, the academics are going to unpack it for you and put it in the British Museum. Perhaps you won't get paid, you know. I've got my coffee here in a new mug which I bought at a Christmas fair this weekend. It says, Borsigvelke, some sort of works, industrial works, I guess. Uh, this is a series of mugs made with the Berlin subway station stop signs, which all have beautiful typography. So I really just got this because it was um, the carrelage, the tiling is yellow. I, I like, I love enamel tiling. Um, and also the, the old fashioned sans serif, um, German typography from, I guess, the 1920s or so. Since we're here in Germany, um, it's almost, there's almost no daylight. That's why I have to fill my kitchen, flood my kitchen with um, halogen light from my heater. And, of course, this strange construction, which could almost be an artwork. You know, I could have won, won the Turner Prize with this. I didn't. I actually liked the Turner Prize this year. I liked the fact that a Scottish... Actually, she's English-born, but she lives in Scotland. Um, a lesbian won it uh, with iPhone videos. Uh, she doesn't really like being described as the iPhone artist, but um, I guess that's what everybody focuses on because it seems like the ultimate demotic sign, although an iPhone is a very expensive thing to buy. And, but the fact that you can get you know, 4K video these days out of iPhones and then make art films because, of course, what you have with you, which is the most light and compact device to capture your everyday experience, is what's going to um, make the, the most expressive tool. That could be one form of advancement. How do I express myself with the minimum of fuss, with the smallest possible, most portable device? Um, it's, it's a miracle. If you imagine Leonardo da Vinci with an iPhone, what could he have achieved? You know, doing simultaneous translation with people all around the world using Siri, um, turning on his lights <laughs> from the other room. All these things you can do with your iPhone now. Um, I'm, I'm still resisting buying any new Apple gadgets, though, I must say. I'm, I'm not um, particularly inspired by any of them, because I like the old ones. This old one is smaller than the new ones. It's got flat, beveled edges. I think they've returned to those, actually, in some of the new models. But the new models don't have the, the Dieter Rams brown 1970s purity. They, don't, they have horrible, you know... One of the color, the color combinations I really dislike is black black, especially Velcro-type black stuff with uh, red piping. That is an absolute no-no in my house. I like white things with pink piping, <laughs> like this white and pink combination, or cream and, and pink combination. That That's a particular favorite of mine. So if Apple made a... But I wouldn't want like an iPhone, cream and pink. Anyway, what am I rambling about? Um, I was going to uh, update you with a video last week when I went to visit uh, an artist friend of mine. It's called Edgar Skluhovs. He's from... Uh, Latvia. Latvia, yes. And um, we had a conversation, some parts of which I might intersperse into this video because actually it attached some really good things. Unfortunately, the battery ran out on the camera halfway through, so it wasn't um, technically very well realized. But um, 
he's a fairly advanced person. Uh, he dresses very well. I met him in Rome last time, um, where he invited me to uh, perform in the Swiss Institute at Rome. They have a magnificent house, which he was uh, he had a residence in residency as an artist. Um, and uh, so I was in the beautiful world of advanced people because because the art world is. Um, it does seem to be a, a place sheltered from all the awful things that the rest of us go through, like Brexit or, you know, the art world doesn't really have to think about that. You can live as some, um, the winner of the Turner Prize, uh, whose name <laughs> I forget just now. Um, she, she seems to live in her own world. That, you know, if she, if she suddenly started talking about Brexit in her videos, it wouldn't be the same, would it? I think we have an idea of an artist that they, they are, the constellation of their world is kind of different. They have different concerns from the concerns that we would find in a newspaper or even find in our best friend when we went to visit our friend, you know. These petty concerns shouldn't um, clutter the, the vision of an artist. And So we forgive artists lots of things as long as they give us a little bit of strangeness. One thing I've been reading recently is uh, Charles Simic poems, and I've gone to uh, actually just spontaneously read one right now. This is a book I bought in Italy when I was in Bologna. It's called Hotel in Insomnia, a collection of uh, a work by this... He's American, but he was born in um, um, Hungary, uh, 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 and he's still alive. He's in his 80s, I think, now. I just love his poetry. I'm really um, getting a lot of... Um, appetite for it and inspiration from it. So I'm just going to open one at random, and it's, it happens to be a poem called The Artist. This is a parallel language edition, Italian on one side and English on the other. The Artist by Charles Simic. Do you remember the crazy guy who stuck candles in his hat so he could paint the sea at night? It's already a pretty good beginning, isn't it? Alone on that empty Jersey beach, he kept squinting into the dark and waving his brush wildly. Teresa said he got the dumb idea from a movie she saw once. Still, there he was, bearded and hairy like the devil himself, piling one murky colour on top of another, while we stood around watching, the candles on his head flickering, then going out, one by one. Gosh, you see, <laughs> this is the trouble with worldliness. Now when you have a character in a poem called Teresa, spelt T-H, you know, the same way as Teresa May, because of the, the um, Brexit inferno that we're in the middle of, it's very difficult to uh, prevent that from becoming a, a poem about Brexit. Uh, the candles going out one by one. Will the last person in Britain please blow out the last candle as you leave? Um, so that's a bit of a failure. It's a failed escape. Um, this morning, for some reason, I've had a Howard DeVoto song rattling around in my head, and it's from his um, solo album, Jerky Versions of the Dream, which is kind of underrated. I mean, severely underrated, I think. Of course, Pete Shelley, his uh, erstwhile partner, died last week, was it, two weeks ago, which is very sad. But uh, it, weirdly enough for me, I never followed the Shelley path when they split up. Devoto Shelley, kind of like Keats Shelley, you know. Um, they split up after the Buzzcocks made Spiral Scratch and Time's Up. And then um, I really was such a Devoto devotee that um, I, I kind of lost track of Pete Shelley. Pete Shelley is kind of more populist in the sense that those songs are universal. You know, ever fallen in love with someone you shouldn't have fallen in love with? What a universal thing. We've all done that. We've all been there. And yet, for some reason, um, I, I prefer these weird songs like Seeing is Believing, the song that was stuck in my head by Howard DeVoto this morning, which goes, and I, I know most of Howard DeVoto's songs by heart, so I'm going to try to recite the lyric to Seeing is Believing from heart, uh, by heart. Um, it's morning, and you're turning over a new leaf you found in the undergrowth. I don't know why something's bothered to change. I don't know, it's not a very interesting hoax. Um, but seeing is believing is making do. Seeing is believing is making do. So look around, look around. See what you find. I may have been overpowered and undermined with these things that are about to happen, and yet they're not. Oh well, it keeps me from getting in trouble when I'm at my local beauty spot where seeing is believing is making do, seeing is believing is making do. So look around, look around, see what you find. I may have been overpowered and undermined. In a way it seems like, 
it's a much more mysterious and a bleak take. It's not ever fallen in love. It's not love at Woolworths. You know, it's not that kind of populism and universality that Pete Shelley had. That admittedly, that's one way to be a fantastic artist is to <clears throat> to touch that human nerve. You know, that everyone has. But another way is to be the the devoter, the obscure, the difficult, the kind of perverse and stubborn, and and yet very trustworthy, artistically very trustworthy person who's always obviously scribbling things down in notebooks and turning them into songs, not because they're going to be hits, not because they're going to touch any universal theme, but because suddenly he has an insight and that's what life seems like to him. It's a, it's a more bleak and existential vision, I think, than Pete Shelley's. And um, for some reason it really hooked me. I really thought it was fresh and original. Freshness, you see, this idea of being advanced, it's all, it's all tied up with being fresh and with being new. This is why I love things like, you know, the design press or um, the art press is that people are constantly, there is this search for originality. And this is something we talked about. This is actually when our conversation got good when I was talking to Edgar last week. And a lot of people in Berlin who are working as artists or designers, you know, they might be making jewellery or whatever it is. But as long as they have that quest for freshness, I, I would consider them to be advanced people who are... I'm, I'm hesitating to use the term avant-garde. It's kind of a bit like the question of populism. You know, the people are... If you ask people what they want, they will tell you, you know, some ridiculous idea or, or, or something from the past. People don't know what they will want in the future. And nobody... It's very hard to predict as a marketing person or as a you know, creative person what people will want and need in the future and what will come to be the classic of the future. It's easy to reproduce past successes, like if you're Oasis, you can be the Beatles, you know, but you, you can't actually create a, a, a contemporary language. It's something Marshall McLuhan actually talked about a lot, whether you could, uh, like artists were, only the, were the only people who were living in the present and the future and everybody else is kind of living in the past. And that's why it's so hard to get new ideas accepted because everyone thinks you have to just be re recreating the past successes all the time. And the music industry is like that, the art world is probably very like that. Do you think, do you think um, <clears throat> originality um, itself is a, is, a, is, a, is a value or is a, is a value high on your list of values? It's high on my list of values, but most people really hate originality. It's actually a sign of failure if you're thinking commercially, and it's um, it's a sign that you're not doing something right, you know, in the, the minds of the, an audience. David Sylvian said something interesting recently. He said he's not making any more music because people hate originality. Mm. People hate uh, actual creativity, and you know there have been studies which show that the most creative pupils in, say, a school are the ones the teachers like least. They're troublemakers because they're asking awkward questions, they're finding different ways to do things, they're, they're screwing everything up. But originality is kind of a, is, is, is a modernist value, a modernist concept. It was not... It's uh, not part in of a, traditional society, no. In, 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 the, in, in the arts up until, up until the, 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 the modern age, um, uh, it was all about uh, mastering something. It's about copy. It's about imitating the masters. Originality um, as as a, as a, as a, um, as a something to strive for or value in an art work or art piece. I think it really kind of just uh, uh, evolved uh, in uh, starting with twentieth century. Well, I slightly disagree because I think modern, I think originality comes out of the bourgeois revolution. In other words, it comes out of that moment, mostly in the eighteenth century, when the bourgeois individualism is born from the commercial classes. So you no longer have the ancien regime of the aristocrats ruling. Suddenly, you have uh, power switching to the commercial classes. So the lower middle classes who are good at business ideas. So I think originality is actually really closely connected to entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And actually, you know, as a kind of leftist myself, I've, it's, I've been very late coming to this idea and I've resisted this idea a lot. But I think it's there nagging at, at the side of what I'm saying, that there is this... It's a combination of things, because my mother calls it évoluer. My mother's... Um, uh, I'm kind of on the same page as my mother in terms of having a huge amount of respect for people who drag themselves up by their bootstraps and build a way of seeing. It doesn't have to be even a way of being. It doesn't have to be an actual practical way of living. Il mestiere di vivere, as uh, Cesare Pavese put it, you know, this business of living. That doesn't interest me so much. People who have a... I mean, I do respect people who have a way to make a living, to live well, um, the art of living... But I'm more interested in the art of art, and that's all about originality. So I was discussing with Edgar whether we still have this kind of interest in and respect for originality, and it seems that we don't, because art critics, for instance, don't seem to talk about it anymore. 
since the postmodern period, originality has been out of fashion. Postmodern artists were all about recontextualizing bits of the past and um, um, you know quoting things in clever ways. And I think some of the modernism's drive to make it new, in Ezra Pound's term, <clears throat> was um, was somewhat lost by that. That energy was dissipated, and we, as a result, we're living in the most conformist times, you know, we, that I've seen in my lifetime. Everyone's trying to normalize their their quirks, you know, with gay people trying to get married just like straight people, whatever it is, on whatever level. Everyone is trying to be the same as everyone else and talk the same way. The internet has had a flattening effect, you know. We all. Um, kind of take our cues from the uh, the big vloggers or celebrities or whatever, even more than we used to do, when at least you could have your own weird celebrities to follow, like David Bowie for me, you know, I, I wasn't going to wear a miniskirt to school and have flamboyant orange hair, but uh, I could take a certain idea of individuality from how David Bowie looked, maybe not even realising where he was copying that from. I think this Brexit thing has really brought a stark clarity to um, to the fact that there are different tribes of people within the same country. And this is one reason why the nation state is a kind of meaningless idea now. I feel, obviously, affinities. I've talked a lot in these broadcasts, these narrowcasts about my affinities, about um, elective affinities, and, say, feeling like you have the same body type as certain people in Asia and therefore feeling more Asian or feeling, you know, go into a certain cafe and you feel instantly at home, go into another and you're totally not in your element. One thing I really have to approach against the Christmas season, which I pay no attention to at all, I don't know why I'm even talking about it, except for the fact that I'm wearing quite Christmassy colours today, um, is that it will inject earworms. If, uh, if I go to even my local supermarket, life... Sorry, real, real supermarket. I'm the devoter thing again. I, I was going in Japan to a supermarket called Life and here to one called Real, so I think of real life. <laughs> so this is real life you're telling me. Um, I get injected with uh, um, George Michael's ghoulish, it's now a thoroughly ghoulish song because uh, Last Christmas, you know, Wham song Last Christmas, which um, considering he died on Christmas Day, I think they should have, there should be a moratorium on that song because it's so horribly ghoulish now. It's like hearing a ghost singing about the day on which he died. Who wants that in the supermarket when you're buying things to continue your life? The food you need to keep living. Why would you listen to a song about last Christmas? It wasn't actually, it was two Christmases ago, but then last year it was even worse because he was singing about the actual Christmas Day on which he died. Last Christmas you gave me your heart. Well, last Christmas my heart gave out, actually. So, um, yeah, I, you know, I, I don't feel at home in, in, in real, because it's not real to me. That's not what I consider real. I have my own reality, which might be a, a Charles Simic poem. I don't know, really. If you look at a century ago, um, 1918, there was so much ferment, you know, between 1910 and 1925, that modernist achievement was amazing, you know, uh, tends to follow world wars, you know, these, these, the 1920s was an amazingly creative decade and also full of social liberalism, mm -hmm. experimentation in terms of what relationships can be, in terms of lesbianism and all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. The 1960s also an amazingly creative decade. These both followed the first war and the second war. What we lack, actually, is maybe a war. Maybe we need a war to have a, a truly creative burst of peace afterwards. I don't know, that's a horribly negative conclusion there. I, I don't want a war. Yeah, this is a, 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 something that the, the theatre director, um, Alvis Hamannis, was saying. Um, uh, he, I mean, he called it kind of the hipster generation, but I mean, this a bit of a misnomer. I mean, he was probably talking about the so-called millennials or whatever, an artist. Yeah. And um, um, uh, how he was describing was what was being produced by them as um, art producers. They're saying, well, they have obviously a, a very good education and knowledge, so they know all the references. They have great taste, so it's very tasteful and stylish and, and, and intelligent. But it's really nothing, nothing new in a sense. It's yeah. always, it's kind of, um, it's, it's um, either referencing something in the past or just replicating it. But what is, what he's always lacking is precisely um, uh, something genuinely new or original at the, at the, at the, at the core of it. It's also the killer instinct which is missing. Like people, every generation in the past had a primal horde in what, what Freud called the primal horde, which is that the group of sons would rise up and kill the fathers. And so do they do that? Um, in Freudian myth, that, that happens. And, and in terms of the art movements, you had the um, 
Salon de Refusé phenomenon, mm -hmm. where you would get the academy of these boring old history painters. Suddenly the young artists would say, that's not for us. And we can't even get into that exhibition anyway with our new style. We are the pre-Raphaelites or the Fauves or whatever they were. And they would have to make their own alternative, you know. And then that becomes the new academy and then a new generation, so on and so on. And in music, we had this with punk coming along when I was young. And, that, and actually, you became a boring old fart, you know. If you were a dinosaur band, you know, if you'd, you were only about 30 years old, but you were already past it, you were finished, you were on the scrap heap of history if, yeah. when punk came along. And that kind of um, obsolescence no longer happens. Bands like Oasis, are, they can be around for 30 years, 40 years, and people don't think they're on the scrap heap. They mm -hmm. will never be on the scrap heap. So there isn't enough murderousness um, in the younger generations. They need to kill their elders. <laughs> yeah. People like you should be killing people like me because I'm 20 years older, right? You should, instead of respectfully interviewing me, you should be killing me. <laughs> or saying that I'm a, on the scrap heap. You know, I mean, a lot of people do say I'm on the scrap heap, probably. But... The, I guess I was never... I never became an orthodoxy, so I'm not um, worthy of being murdered. <laughs> yeah. Crime. Um, my dear Watson, crime is not what it used to be. Sherlock Holmes, for instance, is a, was, a, was a genius, and um, he, uh, in, in a very Nietzschean 19th century way, he wanted the criminals also to be geniuses. He, he really was only happy when he was up against a Moriarty, the Napoleon of crime. He really wanted um, there to be talent, and distinctiveness and individuality in his criminals. So is that what being advanced means? That's a depressing message, isn't it? If we can't be both the everyman and advanced. I suppose you can't by definition, because the idea of the advanced, <clears throat> whether it be in architecture or anything, you know, if your house looks sufficiently different to be original and to make the architecture magazines, it is by definition not a normal house. It's not going to look like the house next door. I was looking, actually, maybe this is a good metaphor of this, I was looking at a house Richard Rogers designed in um, Wimbledon. It's actually right by Wimbledon Common. And it was his first private house. And it's two very simple uh, steel-framed single-story buildings with uh, <clears throat> a little patio between them. And um, he's done the colours very beautifully uh, in, in typical Richard Rogers fashion. So there's this mixture of a sort of Messian modernism and a kind of pretty colour scheme um, on the details, which he did with the Pompidou Centre as well, with the pipes, the colours of the ventilation pipes, <clears throat> and then this, this very simple glass, um, almost industrial structure. So <clears throat> what really is striking when you look at videos or um, pictures of this house in its context is that it's not a, it doesn't fit its context at all. So the bane of um, people who want to make original houses is the town planning regulations or planning regulations that forbid them to do things which jar, which don't fit in with the local environment, because the local environment's usually very poor indeed. So um, <clears throat> you see the houses on either side, they're just sort of suburban brick mansions, and then you see the common in front. Actually, if you look on Street View at the front of that house, you, you almost can't see it because there's a kind of ramp of ivy and shrubbery. And the house is so low behind that that it looks like a vacant site. And only when you go in and see these two buildings do you, get, you grasp their freshness. Rogers actually uh, intended these to be um, kit houses or houses which could be made from already existing parts. The sides of them are actually made from trains, from uh, underground trains, and they have beautiful rounded windows. I think the subway trains that you could get in 1968 were probably more beautiful than the ones you get now. So for finishing off a house, for instance, you could get more pretty forms. Or Now they look good, those forms. But he, he hoped that everybody would embrace modernism and that... Uh, this would be a universal house style of the future. And of course, this idea of the future and people's appreciation for modernism itself, for modernity itself, took a bit of a head spin, a tail spin rather. <laughs> went to some of, our, some of our heads, but went to most of our tails. So of course, this never became a, a, a readily accessible and buildable kid house. And Rogers now is kind of um, quite self-deprecating about that and, and kind of grimly... Um, regretful that it never took off and became a model. And the same with um, Kurokawa in, um, in Japan. The, the metabolists you know, actually had ideas that these would be catalogue modules that you could snap together to make your own kind of building. And none of that's taken off, really, partly because of planning restrictions and partly because of um, um, the distaste people have for the exceptional. People would rather do bog-standard things, you know, um, have their normal houses and their normal locations. 
and their normal lampshades. Open University.